in the first John on a Sunday evening, but as I prepared for this this evening, the brief moments that we have, I was struck by that song. We're practicing that song on Thursday, and that song, I've titled my message after the song, Because He Lives. That's a great song. All right, if that doesn't do something inside your heart, you're dead. Because that's a great song. You may be dead physically or spiritually, but something's wrong. Because, because he lives, 1 Corinthians chapter number 15, if you look there in verse number 17, 18, and 19, Paul says, And if Christ be not raised, your faith is in vain, ye are yet in your sins. Then they also which are fallen asleep in Christ are perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. Little Philip was born with Down's syndrome. He attended a third grade Sunday school class with several eight and nine year old boys and girls. Unfortunately, typical of that age, at times those children did not readily accept Philip because of his differences. But as the story goes, there was a very creative teacher in that Sunday school class. And they began to care about Philip and accept him. And so one day on an Easter morning, the teacher brought these pantyhose containers. The little egg ones? She gave one to each child and said, go out into the, the yard around the church and go put something in there that illustrates the resurrection. So kids ran around. There was a mad house of kids running here and everywhere, and they all came back inside on this lovely spring day. Back in the classroom, they began to share their new life symbols, and they opened up one container. It was a, a flower or a beautiful butterfly or a leaf, and the class would ooh and ah about this. Then one was opened, and... Nothing was inside of it. The children began to exclaim, well, that's stupid. That's not even fair. Someone didn't do their assignment. But Philip spoke up, that's mine. One of the students said, Philip, you don't ever do anything right. And Philip retorted, I did so do it. I did do it because it's empty. The tomb was empty. <laughs> Jesus Christ is alive in this afternoon for a brief few moments. I want to talk about what that means because he lives. Lord, pray you'd help us now. Maybe look in the light of that. May we see your word and your power and strength in Jesus' name, amen. I see a few things. First of all, I see the foundation. Beginning of this chapter, Paul gives us the gospel. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 4. He says, moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel, the good news, probably the best news, right? The very best news, the gospel, which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved. Verse number three, he said, For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. I want to give you a thought to begin this message with, don't ever forget the wonder of the gospel. First Baptist Church, we are excellent soul winners, and I praise God for that. We had many people go out soul winning this past week, and every week we have people going out giving the gospel. But if we're not careful, we will forget in our life the wonder and the power of the gospel. The gospel is not just the track that I hand out. The gospel is not just to a, maybe a homeless individual I give it to or a gas station attendant or to a, a, a lady at a restaurant, a waitress at a restaurant. The gospel is the power of God unto salvation to us. It is our power. It is our salvation. Don't forget the wonder of the gospel. You see someone get saved. They're so excited about it. You stand back, you Christians, and you're like, oh, well, just wait a little while. They won't be as excited any, any longer. Just wait. They won't enjoy the song service any longer after all those songs become old hat to them. It wouldn't be bad if you hummed some of those old hat songs all day long. Some of those hymns be a lot better than sometimes what you got playing on the radio or on your iPod or on your phone, even on Pandora and streaming. You can hum those hymns. It is well with my soul. And Christ the solid rock I stand. Amazing grace. Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus. Rock of ages cleft for me. Don't ever forget the wonder of the gospel. How long has it been, Christian, since you said, Lord, thank you for saving me? Thank you for sending Jesus. Thank you for letting him die on the cross for me. Have you forgot the wonder of the gospel? It's down home Sunday. Maybe it's time to come back down home. The wonder of the gospel. Don't, don't forget the wonder that Christ did. He died for our sins. He was buried and he rose again. There's a uniqueness to the gospel. There's a power in the gospel. There's a wonder and a praise in the gospel. But not only is there a foundation, there's a fallacy. You see, in this chapter, Paul begins to argue that some... We're saying that Jesus didn't rise from the grave. Some, even after that event happened, the, the Pharisees came and they, and they told the soldiers, they told those around, listen, this is not what happened. 
Jesus didn't rise from the grave. Because understand something, if Jesus rose from a grave, some people are going to have a real big problem in life. They're going to have a real big problem because if Jesus did rise from the grave, then maybe, just maybe, what he said was true. Maybe, just maybe, the Bible is true. And maybe, just maybe, uh, what it says is true. And there is a heaven and a hell. We know that to be true. But they don't want to believe that Jesus is alive. They say things like, we've never seen that before, and you're not going to see it now. It's a famous, a famous physicist named Stephen Hawking. He ended up having a debilitating disease right before, and toward the end of his life. He wrote a book, and in that book, he wrote this statement, there is no God. Well, Mr. Hawking, I have news for you. There is a God. He's in heaven, and his son Jesus, who came to earth and lived on earth and died, he rose again. He is also in heaven. And one day, Mr. Hawking, your knee will bow as you bow before Jesus, the Son of God, who is alive. You see, you're going to have a problem, Mr. Hawking. Mr. Charles Darwin. God didn't make the world. That's silly. That's ludicrous. That's not even scientific. What's scientific is that a big boom happened, a big bang. And that's scientific, and, and we've evolved into this. Recently, we went to Chicago as a family, went to the Shedd Aquarium. Neat aquarium. I love aquariums. I, I, I like, they're interesting to me. They had a dolphin show. My favorite part of the aquarium was watching the dolphins. I mean, it's just neat to see animals leap out of the water. I think they said something like up to 20 feet and then come back down in a belly flop. They train these things to do belly flops without pain. Now, that's just cool. In the process, though, they had a picture on the screen of these dolphins, and they showed that their flippers used to be hands. They had five finger bones like we do, and they used to be hands, but gradually they went back to the water, and now they live in the water. I think dolphins are cool. I, one of my favorite things that dolphins do is how they go in the water on their tail and stay up in the water like that, like almost like walk on the water. That's really cool. As cool as that is, I don't want to be a dolphin. I don't want to go back into the water and have to go like do a flip to get a fish from, from a trainer, Right? And yet, even there, they're saying, listen, uh, these dolphins, they were just evolved back into it. It's a wonderful thing. I'm sorry, Mr. Mr. Darwin, you're going to find out that uh, Jesus is alive. There is a God. He did create everything. There's a fallacy out there that Jesus isn't alive. They don't want us to believe in our little crutch. We have a lot of crutches in here. Our faith crutch. Now, they'll say things like this. If that helps you get through your life, that's wonderful. If you live a better life and you're nicer to people, that's, that's sweet. That, that's, that's a neat little thing. Almost like you little condescending two-year-old, you, you, you little child. I'm okay with that. Jesus said, suffer the little children to come unto me and forbid them not for of such is the kingdom of heaven. See, there's a fallacy out there. Paul said this, there's a fear. First Corinthians chapter 15, verse 17 through 19 that we read. If Christ be not raised... Let me paraphrase the rest of that, and you got a problem. If Christ is not alive, then you have a problem. See, that song, Because He Lives, is very scriptural. If He's not alive, number one, our sins are not forgiven. If He's not alive, then we are, as Paul says, of all men most miserable. Because we are wasting our time every single Sunday and Wednesday night. Amen? It means you should be here every single Sunday and Wednesday night. But we're wasting our time. We're wasting our time putting our kids in a Christian school because Jesus, if he's not alive, it doesn't mean anything. Our sins aren't forgiving. We are crushed under our sins. Beyond that, others who have died before us are, are gone. There's nothing there. It's just a, a nothingness. He says, though, that, that our future is forlorn. If Christ is not alive, we have no hope. Our future is forlorn. See, it comes down to faith. We weren't there that day. I wonder what we would have done if we were there that day. I can probably help us out with that. I think we would have ran away with the other disciples. I think we probably would have been doubting like Thomas. Oh, we like to put ourselves into the Bible stories and I would have been there first. I would have believed in Jesus. I would have not doubted at all. That's exactly what Peter said, right? But Paul says, listen, if Jesus isn't alive, we're in a whole heap of trouble. My last point, my most favorite point, is we have the faith. Because Jesus is alive. The Bible tells us this in Matthew chapter 16, that Christ predicted his own resurrection. 
After that, there were numerous sightings of Jesus at the tomb by Mary and uh, to the 12 and then to the 500, as verse 6 of this passage. But not only were there sightings and not only did Jesus predict his resurrection, there was afterwards the unrelenting faith of the disciples. Do you understand that if Jesus is not alive, those disciples who said they saw him were willing to risk their life for a lie. So either they were raving lunatics or they believed something that was real. I prefer to believe the latter, the unrelenting faith of, of the disciples. Even in the face of death, they were the writer insane. There's also the growth of the Christian church. After Peter's message, first sermon, 3,000 people were added to the church. What a church service. 3,000. How do you deal with all those people? There's only 12 of these guys, but they have the power of the Holy Spirit on their life. Not only that, we have the witness of the millions of lives that have been transformed since Pentecost. Just in this church alone, we've seen the power of God touch lives. And I'm not just talking about our addictions ministry, I'm talking about every person in this building. My life is different is because of the power of Jesus Christ. Your life is. You look at our kids who come to a Christian school, their lives are different because Jesus Christ has come in. Life has hope because Jesus is alive. You see, we live in a place where men and women are toiling without a Bible without a Sunday, without prayer, without songs of praise. There are rulers without justice and without righteousness. We have homes without peace and marriages without sanctity. We have men and, and women without purity. We have boys and girls without, in, without innocence, without enthusiasm. We have mothers without wisdom, without self-control. We have fathers without, work, without, without a work ethic. We have poverty without relief and sickness without hope or skill for tender care. We have sorrow and crime without a remedy. And worst of all, we have death without hope. Because Jesus brings hope. We have hope because he is alive. Because he lives, we have hope. Hope that is better than this. Aren't you glad this isn't all there is? That all there is isn't just a brand new car? That's neat, but I'm glad it's bigger than that. Or a, or a great restaurant? Or a big paycheck? Or or even winning a huge amount of money. Aren't you glad it's bigger than this? It's bigger than a beautiful summer day. Bigger than even introducing a young child into your arms. It's bigger than this. We have hope because he's bigger than this. He holds the world together. We have hope because Jesus is alive and life has hope. And lastly, because he lives, we win. Coached the girls' volleyball team, and Friday night they played a tremendous game. A tough, hard-fought game. We recently lost a player to injury. That was tough for the team. Years ago, we talked about with the girls about volleyball, and uh, that volleyball is fun when winning is fun. No one likes to lose. I don't know about you, but I don't play games to lose. Okay? If you do, come play me. I'll be happy to play you. All right, now... You don't get upset about losing, you don't cry about losing, you don't burn the place down if you're losing, but I don't play a game to lose. That's not the way games are designed to be. They're, they're played to be won, all right? And, and usually in a game in real life, someone wins and someone loses, right? Now, the new life is everyone wins and gets a medal, but that's different, okay? Do you know, in, in this life, we get to win. We don't lose when we have Jesus Christ. We get to win, it's a guarantee to win. It's not, I hope I win, I, I want to win. Jesus says, you get to win. There's that old song, I read the back of the book, and we win. He says in this chapter, Paul says, Oh, death, where is thy sting? O oh, grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. I'm tired of Christians who forgot that they win. Life is over. I'm not feeling too well today. Hey, we win. We win. Life is over. I got this big consumer's bill. I'm sorry, but we win. We win. Oh, you won't believe it. I had a flat tire on the way to work. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I really am. But guess what? We win. It's a story told. A little boy and his father were driving down a country road on a beautiful spring afternoon. Suddenly, out of nowhere, a bumblebee flew into the car window. The little boy was deathly allergic to bee stings. He became petrified. 
I can relate to this story because my brother is very allergic to bee stings as well. In fact, I remember when we were in, uh, I was in high school, he was in elementary school, he got stung. My mom drove him to the emergency room. The doctor at that time said to my mother, don't ever drive him again because next time he gets stung, he will die. He's that allergic to them. It was a few years later that we were at a soccer game at Community Baptist of Saginaw. My brother Joe got stung with a bee while I was right near him. All I could think of was that a doctor said about five, six years earlier, I grabbed my brother's EpiPen and shoved it in his leg and called the ambulance. To this day, I think I saved my brother's life. So when I read this story about this little boy being petrified, petrified I completely get it. I get it. Little boy's in this car and he's, he's petrified. This bumblebee's flying around the car. Since the boy was so allergic, the father quickly reached out. As the story goes and grabbed the bee and squeezed it in his hand, then released it. But as soon as he let it go, the, the bee began to buzz around again and the son began to become frantic again. But as the story goes, the father reached his hand back out and showed his son and said, Son, don't worry about the bee because, you see, I've taken the sting out for you. And in his hand was a stinger from the bumblebee. Jesus reaches out to us. And this life may seem tough at times. There may be hardship and trouble. But Jesus says, don't worry, my child. I've taken the sting out for you. Don't worry about that. I've got the stinger right here. Oh, death, where is thy sting? Oh, grave, where is thy victory? And Jesus says, there's nothing to worry about. Because he lives, I could face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. Because he lives, we are not of all men most miserable. We have of all men have the most hope. Lord, I thank you for your word. I thank you for Jesus. He didn't just stay in that grave, Lord, but he rose on the third day. Thank you that we can trust you. Lord, may we never forget about the wonder of the gospel and the power of your resurrection. I wonder today, in this afternoon, down-home Sunday service, maybe your heart's been burdened. Maybe you've looked at some circumstances, seen some things, and you basically, quite frankly, have forgotten that he lives. What I would say, Brother How, would you pray for me? I needed that reminder today. Maybe I've been down a little bit, discouraged perhaps, and set back, but would you pray for me that I would remember, recall the fact, the amazing fact that God lives? Lord, touch my heart. Would you pray for me? Let, lift your hand up, lift it down. Amen. 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 Who else? Amen. Amen.